Welcome back to a new episode of G-Week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be covering stories from President Biden building a border wall to moving the commanders to play at the Robert F. Kennedy Stadium. We'll also highlight a series of good news across the world and the Cisneros Institute and their research into mental health. Stay tuned. I'm Emma Grace Myers. And I'm Preston Summit. Earlier this month, Hamas initiated a surprise attack on Israel, with Israeli death counts exceeding 1,400, according to Time. Israel retaliated by attacking the Gaza Strip, where Palestinian death counts are more than 7,000, according to Time, but they haven't been able to independently verify this. GW for Israel hosted a solidarity demonstration with a vigil earlier this month. Students for Justice in Palestine also hosted a vigil earlier this month. University President Ellen Granberg released a statement in response to SJP's vigil, where she says, quote, I abhor the celebration of terrorism and attempts to perpetuate rhetoric or imagery that glorifies acts of violence, end quote. SJP responded by asking, quote, how dare you call our morning a celebration of terrorism, end quote, according to their Instagram post. This week, members of SJP projected several messages like, quote, GW, the blood of Palestinians is on your hands, end quote, on the Estelle and Melvin Gelman Library. In response, seven members of the House of Representatives, who are also GW alumni, wrote a letter, quote, in total disgust, end quote, to President Granberg, condemning the projected messages, according to the GW hatchet. GW for Israel released a statement on their Instagram Thursday after the projections, saying, quote, if the GW community wants to genuinely support innocent people, we must not only condemn terrorism, but also the celebration of terrorism on campus, end quote. The Cisneros Hispanic Leadership Institute is dedicated to fostering an interdisciplinary approach to Latino studies. Their research examines a wide range of topics from immigration policy to healthcare disparities to cultural identity. Brooke Forget has the story. The Cisneros Institute made its research initiative by calling parents and asking them to talk about their kids' experiences by generating excitement and garnering attention. The study by Professor Roche focuses on Latino youth who experience depression, anxiety, or other mental health issues during middle school and the potential risk of long-term consequences of these challenges. Dr. Elizabeth Becerra, the executive director of the Cisneros Hispanic Leadership Institute, is a co-author. This research has been successful by the help of undergraduate project coordinator Jacqueline Diocese and Annabelle Manzo, and student researchers Georgette Encinas and Christopher Juarez Moreno. This Pathways to Health study um, is a longitudinal study, um, and it was um, in effect and re previously done um, um, for the past since like 2016, about. Um, and so me and Jackie came onto this project recently in, in 2021. Um, in 2021, it started this second era of the study. And so all research done before was using surveys, um, asking the, the adolescents, the Latino adolescents, what they were experiencing. Um, and then now in this new um, part of the, of the study of Pathways to Health, we're now um, trying to implement this second layer of analysis and research um, on, on this community. So now we're implementing, um, trying to see how biological markers of stress like cortisol um, that we can see through their hair and, and saliva, um, how we can see what is physically, biologically happening in their body that can try to tell us more information. Um, well, the age group is, um, let me break it out into parts, right? The age group is very important because we are catching them before they transition into high school um, when important changes happen regarding expectations in education, changes in, uh, in families, etc. right? So this is a good time to, uh, to see um, uh, changes in emotional well-being as we study, stress, etc. that are going to increase over the next uh, few years as they become, you know, young adults. The most interesting part of our research is that it not only affects immigrants or undocumented immigrants of Latin origin, which is what we are looking for this study, but also families who are here with green cards, like have uh, U.S. citizenship, that you would think that those immigration policies don't matter to them because they are not immigrant themselves. But communities are intertwined. Communities are um, 
um, co connected to one another. So even if you might not be an immigrant yourself, you might have family members who are immigrants or they are undocumented. So the the effects, the negative effects, the consequences um, went way farther than immigrant communities. We are um, working in a state in, which is called like a new immigrant destination. So it's an area of the United States that has not traditionally received Latinx uh, immigrants from uh, Latin America, but now we are seeing a, a larger influence uh, from these groups. So there is not the same support networks as let's say New York, for example, or areas in Texas where you can see more of these populations. So how to uh, navigate those, those experiences are gonna be very different than what we find in other states. Also, uh, Georgia is not particularly immigrant friendly. So we, are, we can also understand the experiences of these youth based on uh, state-level policies, for example, which are going to be different depending on where we are. And in particular, as I was saying, Georgia is fairly anti-immigrant. So their experiences need to be understood uh, within that context. The Institute is not only conducting groundbreaking research, but it's, it's also actively engaging with the community through hosting regular events like seminars and workshops to promote dialogue and understanding. At the Cisneros Institute at George Washington University continues to expand its research and impact. It reaffirms the importance of understanding and celebrating the diverse experiences of Latino and Latina communities in the United States and the importance of mental health. For G Week, I'm Brooke Porcher. Thanks, Brooke. This past week, President Joe Biden and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese met at the White House to discuss various topics, including climate change and national security. While in the meeting, both leaders assured that they, quote, were united against all acts of aggression, particularly by Russia and the Hamas, end quote, according to BBC. While the leaders had plenty of issues they could agree on, there was one main issue of division with China. The president took a more definitive approach and said that U.S. forces are keeping their commitment to the Philippines. The Australian prime minister's answer was focused on helping whenever they could, rather than a firm stance on either side. Overall, the leaders work together to strengthen their relationship for their countries. DC's historic RFK Stadium may become home to new commercial spaces and possibly a modernized stadium. Nina Rodriguez has the story. The Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Stadium, more commonly known as RFK Stadium, was built in 1961 under the name of District of Columbia Stadium. It was one of the first multi-purpose stadiums in the U.S. and was made for baseball and football games but it has held all kinds of events from the Olympics to the Beatles in concert. However, it has been a long time since RFK Stadium's glory days. It has been left unused and threats of demol demolition have been hovering over it in recent years. However, a federal bill is being considered by the House of Representatives that would remodel the stadium and make it into community space with shops, housing, green spaces, and potentially a newer replacement stadium. For a while, there was talk of the stadium being used for the Commanders, Washington DC's NFL team, the controversy surrounding management issues kept that from happening. This remodel is still very much under consideration, but it opens up possibilities for new community spaces that could be benefits for residents in surrounding areas. I'm Nina Rodriguez for G Week. Thanks, Nina. A University of Pennsylvania student died after drinking Panera's charged lemonade, leading to a lawsuit against the company. Sarah Katz, who was 21, went into cardiac arrest and passed away hours after drinking a charged lemonade from Panera, according to CBS News. Katz had a heart condition called Long QT Syndrome Type 1, which led her to avoid energy drinks and drinks with high caffeine, according to CBS News. Clocking in at 390 milligrams, one charged lemonade has more caffeine than a can of Red Bull and a can of Monster combined, according to the New York Times. The lawsuit, filed by Katz's parents, focuses on the fact that the drink's caffeine content is not labeled clearly on Panera's menu. Panera said that they, quote, strongly believe in transparency around our ingredients, end quote, and will, quote, work quickly to thoroughly investigate this matter, end quote, according to the New York Times. Let's welcome Dan Salim, who will now be hosting our new weather segment. Take it away, weatherman Dan. Thanks, guys. Good morning, and welcome to our brand new G-Week weather segment. I'm weatherman Dan, and here's the scoop. So we're gonna start off with Sunday. Sunday, the 29th, is gonna be 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. It's gonna be a little cloudy, and that's gonna be a change from the warm weather that we've been seeing for the past few days. Now, given that high pressure system in our area, you'll see that in a bit. We've had a few dry days, but the next couple of days of rain are gonna make up for that. Moving on to Monday, we're seeing a little bit of a, uh, a more of a temperature drop. 
with a high of 72 and a low of 50. And flash forward to a less rainy, but still a little bit rainy uh, Halloween, it's still going to be chillier. And we've been experiencing that with a, uh, with a high of 53 and a low of 42. Spotty morning showers come back on Wednesday with an even colder high of 53 and a low of 38. And it's looking like a chilly yet sunny set of days to close off the rest of the week. So now we're going to take a look at what's causing these weather changes and the temperature drop on a regional scale. So I want you to notice this belt of precipitation as well as that high pressure system and that cold front coming in. So as you can see, we've got that precipitation, but it's a little spotty and that's why you're not going to see constant rain all day. So those spats of rain are going to be from Sunday to Wednesday. Now what I want you to notice though is that high pressure system behind that precipitation belt. So right there in blue, we've got snow, snow in the Midwest, and that dry, arid, high pressure system is going to pick up that snow and bring it over to the East Coast, and that is what's going to give us those cold, cold days. We're unlikely going to get another gust from the Southern Gulf, so ladies and gentlemen, we are in fall. Bring out those jackets. This is a true autumn week of weather. So that's your peak in the next week's forecast. Tune in next time, but until then, this is Weatherman Dan wishing you a happy Halloween, GW. Back to you, MN Preston. Thanks, Weatherman Dan. A Category 5 hurricane caused flooding and power outages in more than 500,000 homes among Mexico's southern coast on Wednesday, and at least 27 people have died, according to CNN. Hurricane Otis brought 165 mile-per-hour winds, heavy rainfall, and landslides to the resort town of Acapulco, leaving the main highway completely obstructed. Many tourist destinations and resorts were left completely underwater, and most communication to the area was completely cut off. Hurricane response was delayed due to the speed at which Hurricane Otis developed, with weather analysts calling it, quote, nightmare scenario, end quote, according to the National Hurricane Center. Though Otis quickly dissipated into a tropical storm Wednesday afternoon, it broke multiple records for its quick escalation. Experts called it, quote, the strongest storm ever to make landfall on the East Pacific coast, end quote, according to AP News. In world news, advancements in solar-powered cars and new accolades from the Guinness Book of World Records remind us that there are still plenty of exciting achievements to feel good about in the world. Today, we're highlighting some of these feel-good stories from October. Katherine Sarancheck has the story. Here at G-Week, it's our job to bring you the news you need to feel informed about the world, the United States, D.C., and of course, our very own Foggy Bottom. With that responsibility, we also acknowledge that the world news can be overwhelming and highly distressing, especially with the ongoing Ukrainian, Russian, and Israeli Hamas wars occupying our news feeds. While we recognize the severity of these conflicts and the unprecedented state of international relations, today we're highlighting some achievements and hopeful steps in the right direction around the world. Starting our good news coverage is an exciting advancement in the automotive industry as the world's first off-road solar SUV drove across Morocco powered only by the sun earlier this month. According to CNN, the car was built by a group of students at Idenhoven University of Technology and utilizes solar panels on its roof to harness the sun's energy. With the continued advancements in zero emission cars worldwide, this is undoubtedly an exciting prospect and a step in the right direction for sustainable vehicles. On other exciting news, the Rolling Stones launched their first album in 18 years on October 20th much to the excitement of longtime U.S. fans who've been listening since their first album release in 1964. The album, Hackney Diamonds, is a mix of everything, according to lead singer Mick Jagger, and includes an array of love songs, ballads, and country. The album also features other incredible artists such as Paul McCartney, Stevie Wonder, Charlie Watts, and Lady Gaga. According to VOA, Jagger says Lady Gaga's feature was unplanned, saying, quote, she walked in next to me and we started singing together referencing Running Into Gaga at the Next Door studio in LA. Another inspiring headline is artist Nathan Wyburn's most recent project, in which he created iconic landscapes from food and donated them to hungry people. Made from organic fruits and vegetables, the landscape creations depict beloved UK landmarks, including Stonehenge, Avon George, Giant's Causeway, and the famous Suspension Bridge, marking the end of the 2023 harvest season. Wyvern hopes his art can, quote, inspire people to support homegrown organic farming. And finally, another record has been broken in the Guinness Book of World Records, but this time that award is going to a cat in the United Kingdom. Bella, a particularly nosy feline, has received the accolade of the world's loudest purr. 14-year-old Bella can purr up to 54.49 decibels, equivalent to a boiling tea kettle. 
According to a Fox News interview with Bella's owner, Nicole Spink, the award does not surprise the family, who are very aware of Bella's impressive purr. And that concludes our coverage of recent good news around the world. For G Week, I'm Katherine Cernicek. Thanks, Katherine. A staff member for Senator Katie Britt was robbed last week near Capitol Hill, according to Fox 5 DC. The assailant, armed with a handgun, demanded her purse and car keys before taking her car and fleeing the scene. Britt, an Alabama senator, gave a statement criticizing the high crime rates within the city, stating, quote, it is infuriating and completely unacceptable that an American who is on Capitol Hill to serve her country cannot safely walk the streets of Washington, D.C. at 8.30 at night, end quote, according to the Washington Post. This is one of several attacks against congressional staff members and Congress members in the past few months. President Joe Biden said he would continue a Trump-era project by extending the border wall in Starr County, Texas. Ananya Gundesi has the story. President Joe Biden announced earlier this month that he would continue the construction of a wall along the southern border of the U.S., a project that was started by former President Donald Trump. Biden maintains that he believes the border wall is not an effective solution for security and promised during his campaign that there would be, quote, not another foot, end quote, of border wall construction during his presidency. In defending this decision, Biden said that the funds appropriated for the wall were already in place and that he was unsuccessful in lobbying Congress to change that. The construction will happen in Starr County, Texas, an area where U.S. Border Patrol has seen approximately 250,000 illegal entries, according to the Department of Homeland Security. To authorize construction, the Biden administration waived multiple federal laws, largely relating to the environment. In fact, environmental advocates are furious as the proposed wall will divide a habitat for an endangered species of cat, the ocelot. Lake and Jordal, a conservation advocate for the Center of Biological Diversity, called the project, quote, a horrific step backwards for the borderlands, end quote. But it's not just the wall. Venezuelans who previously have been granted temporary protection status are now beginning deportations back to their country. This weak sanction on immigration is leading many in the community to fear what will happen next. Venezuelan student Elisa Tailhardat gives her perspective on the issue. Well, I understand that accommodating this large influx of people is difficult. I think it's important for him to be consistent with his original policy, given that Venezuela, for example, is a country where, where human rights have been completely um, undermined. I think it's important to be able to find how to create the infrastructure for them and like at least continue TPS where they were able to get two months, uh, sorry, two years assured and be able to find some stability before like rethinking their next few moves. The conflicting statements from the Biden administration drew critique from not just the public, but also from both sides of the aisle. Republicans criticized Biden's initial delay in constructing the wall, with Representative James Comer calling his hesitation, quote, detached from reality, end quote. Democrats, meanwhile, dislike the apparent reversal of policy, with Representative Pramila Jayapal saying, quote, walls don't work. It's that simple, end quote. For G Week, I'm Ananya Gunnessi. Thanks, Ananya. Representative Mike Johnson of Louisiana was voted the new House Speaker on Wednesday, ending weeks of chaos on the House floor, according to CNN. The House has been without a speaker for three weeks as Congress faces a November funding deadline and talks on funding Ukraine and Israel still remain in question. Many other House Republican nominees were unable to secure the 217 floor votes needed to be elective. Representative Jim Jordan was the first to be voted as the party's nominee for speaker, but after three failed floor votes, he bowed out of the running, according to AP News. Johnson had unanimous GOP support behind him with 220, while Democrat Hakeem Jeffries had 209 votes, according to CNN. A known Trump ally, Representative Johnson played a key role in the GOP's failed efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Now, let's turn over to Thea Lawson and Valeria Martinez Vijegas, our lifestyle correspondents, who will be highlighting their top five fall treats. With sweater weather and a full swing, our taste buds are eager to try new and fall-themed delights every day. 
After rigorous surveying and, of course, taking into account our own personal biases, we've gathered a list of the top five bakeries and hot spots around D.C. to get the best fall treats to satisfy those pumpkin spice cravings. First up is Bacon Wired. Their pumpkin gingerbread is a must-try, along with a blend of fruits and nuts in their per pecan coffee cake slice. For cupcake lovers, their dirty chai cupcake and the great pumpkin cupcake are a must-try. And the ginger molasses cookie, a perfect blend of the spice and sweetness. If your mouth isn't watering yet, it will be after hearing what Firehook Bakery has to offer this season. Located in DuPont, some of their festive offerings include their pumpkin cheesecake and pumpkin bars. Nothing beats bundling up in your favorite fall sweater and treating yourself to a slice of their honey crisp apple pie or pecan pie. Be sure to update your Instagram for that autumn aesthetic by indulging in an iced sugar cookie leaf, a cookie that tastes just as good as it looks. With three different locations around D.C., District Donuts offers a new and improved fall menu with donut flavors like maple bacon, coffee cake, and personal favorite, Spice Old Fashioned. District Donuts always keeps customers on their toes with flavors that rotate each week. So be sure to visit soon so you can go ahead and grab these unique donuts while you can. Another bakery located in DuPont, in Je ne sais quoi, delivers a place in our rankings for its warm tea offerings. Enjoy some of their fine teas and honey imported from France. A personal favorite of mine is their chai cardamom blend, which easily pairs with any of their warm pastries, like their apple turnover or pear tart. Un je ne sais quoi promises to satisfy those fall cravings while treating you to some European elegance this season. If you're in the mood for a cozy meal paired with a good book, head to Kramer's. They offer a caramel apple waffle, which goes perfect with a foamy cappuccino for that heavenly taste of autumn. Other tasty treats include cinnamon French toast and a chai panna cotta that is sure to leave you with that cinnamon spice flavor that we all love. Honorable mentions that didn't make our top five but still deserve a spotlight include Tate, a fan favorite amongst UW students, for their maple walnut carrot and cinnamon walnut coffee cakes. More into festive drinks? Starbucks has you covered with iconic drinks including their pumpkin spice frap, pumpkin chai, and caramel apple spice cider. Looking to try your hand to make your own fall-themed treats? You can never go wrong with Trader Joe's ready-to-bake pumpkin ginger scones or pumpkin muffin mix. If you are someone that enjoys gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegan treats, make sure you visit their websites and look for the best options for you. And that concludes our list of top five spots around D.C. to indulge in some fall-themed treats. We hope you're as excited for the season as we are and that these desserts can quench those pesky pumpkin spice cravings. You know, I would love to do the old, the old fashioned like spice donut. That sounds so good this morning. Oh my God. That's I so want to go to like one of those pumpkin patches and get like pumpkins and the donuts and apple cider. It's just hard. There's not a lot around DC. It's mostly like Maryland. I know. And yeah, it's like, we don't absolutely. have cars, but yeah. at least we have like fall spots that are good on campus. I'm excited. I'm going to go indulge after this episode. <laughs> Great. Definitely. Definitely. Cinnamon themed coffee just sounds so good right now. <laughs> Any coffee. Oh yeah. <laughs> GW is currently looking for a new director for the Disability Support Services. Its previous director, Maggie Butler, stepped down last month after running the organization for two years. According to the GW Hatchet, over the past four years, DSS has lost about half of its staff, dropping from 11 staff members in the 2018-2019 year to just six in the 2022-2023 school year. Former staff members say they became, quote, overburdened, end quote, and were expected to take on the responsibilities of prior staff members who have left. Instead of the university finding replacements for the positions, according to the GW Hatchet. These issues in the DSS staff have led some students struggling to get the necessary accommodations since there is not enough staff to deal with the volume of student requests. Also according to the GW Hatchet, student executive board members of the Disabled Student Collective are currently undergoing an investigation with some of these former staff members to figure out what changes need to be made to make a better working environment for the staff. DC's mayor, Muriel Bowser, recently passed a new legislation that attempts to prohibit retail theft and drug markets, according to the Washington Post. This recent legislation responds to the city's high spike of violence within recent decades. In accordance with this spike, the D.C. police are experiencing low staffing turnouts. Mayor Bowser's bill, the Addressing Crime Trends Now Act, satisfies concerns of business owners and public safety officials through redefining theft as a felony crime 
and declaring areas to be drug-free, according to the Washington Post. However, the bill is receiving criticism, as it does not address other forms of violent crime, such as carjacking, homicide, gun violence, or robberies. This bill retains many of the policing changes made following the murder of George Floyd in 2020. Council members plan to hold a hearing regarding this bill this fall. That's all we have for this episode. For G-Week, I'm Emma Grace Myers. And I'm Preston Summit. Happy Halloween, GW!